In our last video, we started introducing the classical electromagnetic theory of solids, and we got into the Lorentz model and how we can model a solid as being atoms or molecules held together by springs. Now we're going to consider what happens when we stick our solid into an electric field and how we can put this together. When we put a material, uh, a dielectric material, into an electric field, it is going to be affected in different ways that depend on the macroscopic properties of the field and of the material. So we've got an electric field strength E, we've got a polarization P, and we've got the electric displacement of the medium D. And I'm going to define all of these things. So the polarization is given by the electric permittivity, which is epsilon zero, uh, and also the electric susceptibility, which is uh, the chi, and the electric field. So we have electric permittivity of free space. We have a thing that depends on the material itself, and then the electric field. Now, the displacement, D, is related to both the electric field and the polarization. The displacement, D, is given by the electric field times the permittivity of free space plus the polarization. But remember that our polarization is given by this term, which is the permittivity of free space, the susceptibility of the material, and the electric field. So now we can take this out, and we can basically define this 1 plus chi, which is the susceptibility, as the relative permittivity. And so what we get is that the electric displacement D is the response of the material to an electric field, and you can think of it as being the relative permittivity times the electric field. So remember in our last video, we talked about we have a system of atoms or molecules, they're connected by springs, and when it oscillates in an electric field, because the charges are forced to move in the electric field, the springs are going to force the electrons or charged particles back into place. The motion is affected by friction, and we think of that as a damping force. Um, and we can basically say that we have an equation of motion where we have an acceleration. So we have a force that is the acceleration of the particle, where delta is the displacement, and m is the mass of the particle. Here, b is the damping force. So now we've got a damping coefficient or friction uh, and the velocity. And here we've got the spring constant. So this is the restoring force. And all of this force is imposed upon the particles by the electric field. So the force on the particle is its charge times the electric field. And that's all written down right there. Isn't that nice? For light, we're going to assume that the um, electric field is basically just a time harmonic. It's, it, it, think of it as a sine wave, if you like. So this is my equation of motion. I've got particles in my solid, and they're going to move like this according to the charge and the electric field. And it's going to depend on the mass of the particles and the damping and the spring constant. Remember, we also came up with a term for the allowed frequencies. Uh, and so what we have is uh, the natural frequency of the material is now given by eta over m. Yes, I completely understand that there's a whole factor of two to four disappearing in here. Don't worry about it right now. But what we've got is that our spring constant is related to the mass of the particles and its natural frequency. We can also then write this damping force as a damping coefficient times the mass because you know, the force and the mass are gonna be interrelated. And so now what I can do is basically divide this through by M and I end up with uh, another equation for the motion, but now I've got acceleration uh, with a damping coefficient and a natural frequency, and it relates to the charge on the particle, the electric field, and the mass of the particle. Uh, this is also known as the abraham lorentz equation. So there's that Abraham Lorentz equation again. And an equation like this has solutions that look something like this. This is a complex number. It has an imaginary part to it. And so we've got the displacement of the oscillator is given by the charge, the mass, the damping coefficient, 
And then this is the frequency of the light and this is the natural frequency of the material. So if you approach the natural frequency, you can see that this number goes very small. And so this number goes very high. So you can see right away that you're going to get uh, a much bigger displacement of the oscillator and therefore a much bigger effect when you're close to the resonance. But what this really does is it induces a dipole moment. Depending on what the frequency is, you're going to have a bigger or smaller difference in you know, displacement of your charges, but it's going to give you a polarization that's changing all the time as it moves backwards and forwards. So we have our induced dipole moment. The electric dipole moment is p hat, and it's a, a measure of the polarity. And so for a single oscillating unit, we can basically say that our dipole moment is the charge times the displacement. Since we have an equation for our displacement, we have for a, a single charge, a single piece of our uh, solid, it's going to have a, an induced dipole moment that is given by this equation. And there's that equation again. This electric dipole moment is related to the electric field, but it's also related to an intrinsic quality of the material, the charge, the mass, its damping quality, and its natural frequency. And we call this the polarizability of the atom or molecule or solid. And that's usually given the letter alpha, which is also overused. So here we've got that uh, the dipole moment is given by alpha times the electric field. So if we bring those together, we can see that we have the term, the polarizability alpha is given by this equation. So now we have the dipole moment and the polarizability for a single oscillator. If there are n oscillators per unit volume, then our macroscopic polarizability or polarization P is given by the number density times the individual dipole moment, which is the number density times the polarizability times the electric field. Now remember that we have a displacement D that is given by the electric field times the permittivity of free space plus the polarizability. So we can put that together and have the polarizability put in in terms of the individual polarizations. And so now what we can do is we can say our relative permittivity of our material is given by the permittivity of free space plus the polarizability times the number density of those polarizabilities for individual particles. Remember, we also worked out that this is the equation for the polarizability of individual particles. And so now we have an equation for the relative permittivity of the material. So this is, our material is gonna behave and it depends on the number density of oscillators, depends on the charges, the masses, the natural frequency, and the damping. But this is all stuff that has to do with our individual materials. So that's the equation we just came up with for our relative permittivity. And this is a complex number. It's got an imaginary part and a real part. So we can break this down into E1 being the real part and E2 being the imaginary part. And so now I've got a real imaginary part of the complex dielectric function, which we talked about in a previous video. So here is my real part and imaginary part. And if I plot them, I'm gonna get something that looks like this. So this is the dielectric function. This is in photon energies, but that's proportional to uh, frequency. So that works. And here you can see where it says normal dispersion, anomalous dispersion, normal dispersion. Normal dispersion just means that the real part has a positive slope. It is going up with energy. It has an anomalous slope when it goes down with frequency, and then it goes up again in frequency for normal slope gap. And here we can see the imaginary part. And here, this is where we have a resonance, where you are approaching the natural frequency of the material. You've got the resonance. So we've got right at this wavelength or frequency right here, yeah, we're going to have uh, an absorption at that point. So remember in a previous video, we talked about the relationship between the complex refractive index and the complex dielectric function, and that they are related by this term where the complex refractive index is the square root of the complex dielectric functions. 
So I just to make it a little easier, I'm doing it in terms of the square of the complex refractive index. And so now I can multiply this out and I can put the, the complex dielectric function in terms of the refractive index and vice versa. Okay, and then we can also do it the other way and say, what is the real and imaginary part of the complex refractive index in terms of the real and imaginary part of the complex dielectric function? So you can see that they are closely related, but we have an equation for well, epsilon one and epsilon two, the complex dielectric function. And so now we can see how that relates to our complex refractive index. So let's have a look at what we get when we compare them. So this is similar to the graph we were looking at before. E1 is the real part of the dielectric function. It's this bright red. It goes down, up, and then down again. And then here we've got the imaginary part in this slightly terracotta-y, pinky color. Now let's have a look at the complex refractive index. So here I've got N is the real part in bright red. And again, the dusky, pinky, terracotta -y color. That is the imaginary part. You can see that neither of these ever goes negative. You don't want N to be negative. That would be problematic. That would make the light change direction. And you can't have the K part to be negative. We'll get into why that is later. But remember, we talked in a previous video about how this has to do with absorption. And so if, if this is positive is a, an absorption, then if it becomes a negative number, you are spontaneously generating light. And that's problematic. So in summary, we have been comparing the microscopic and macroscopic quantities and how the electric field uh, affects a real material. And then we've compared that to what we've learned about the relationship between the complex dielectric function and the Lorentz model. And therefore we've got a nice relationship between the natural frequency and the dielectric function and how that then relates to the optical properties or complex refractive index of a given material.